I'm, I'm delighted to have Lindsay Shepard and David Haskell here um, to talk to us in this, uh, in this session. Uh, they'll talk for, uh, for a little while, and then we'll have a, a question and answer period with the two of them. David Haskell is an associate professor of digital media and journalism and religion and culture at Wilfrid Laurier University. He studied here at Western and at U of T and, and obtained his PhD from Potchefstroom University. Before becoming a, a professor at uh, Wilfrid Laurier University, David uh, worked as a journalist in both print and television, and he taught journalism at Conestoga College in Kitchener. He's also been a high school teacher and a musician. Uh, 82 years old? <laughs> <laughs> Lindsay Shepard, also 82 years old, <laughs> is, a, is a master's student in uh, cultural analysis and social theory at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Communication from Simon Fraser University in, British, in um, Burnaby, British Columbia. She was the recipient recently of the Outstanding Student Award from the Heterodox Academy. And on May 12, she'll be presented with the Harry Weldon Canadian Values Award for her defense of freedom of expression, thought, and diversity of views. So join me in welcoming David Haskell and Lindsay Shepard. Uh, thank you, everyone. We're going to conduct this uh, conversation similar to an interview. Uh, we have gone over what the questions will be, but we really haven't talked about the responses. We just wanted to make sure we knew where we wanted to go. We have about 35 minutes for this discussion, and then we're going to move on to the question and answer period. So if we miss something that you're curious about, then please keep it in mind, and we'll come to it at the question and answer. So to begin, uh, Lindsay, let's start with something I know but maybe people don't. How did you end up at uh, Wilfrid Laurier in the first place? Yeah, so um, back in 2013, this is right after I would graduated high school, really, Jordan Peterson reached out to me. Right. And he said, I'm going to give you an opportunity. Right. Would you like yeah. to be a right-wing operative? Right. Oh, okay. Okay, so yeah. Jordan Peterson, he comes to you just after high school. Yeah. And, and he begins grooming you. He begins grooming you? Like yeah, it's been years. So, and, okay. And from the start, it was Wilfrid Laurie University, and right. I'd have to apply in 2017. Right, that's a long, that's the long con. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Whoa. All right. <laughs> Obviously, that's not true. <laughs> and, and you know, and, and, and you know as well that somebody's going to cut this piece from YouTube, <laughs> and it's going to appear. Here's where Lindsay Shepard admits that she was the operative, the confederate of Jordan Peterson. But, but honestly, how did you end up at Wilfrid Laurier? Um, more simple reasons. So I did my Bachelor in Communication at Simon Fraser University in BC, because I'm from Burnaby, which is just outside of Vancouver. And I thought, I want to do my MA in Ontario, because I've never lived there. So I just looked at what there was. I was looking at communication, um, but I decided Sometimes communication can be a little bit um, superficial in the topics it covers. So in the alphabetical list right under communication studies was cultural analysis and social theory. And I thought that sounds like a little deeper. Right. So I applied to that instead. So you thought you were getting away from the frivolousness of communications by going into cultural analysis and social theory. <laughs> Which turned out to be worse. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I'm not making a judgment. I'm just... I'm I fully... <laughs> Now, for my own part, uh, so I've been at uh, Laurier for 12 years, and um, when I came in, I was naive about critical theory. I didn't know what it was. I kept hearing my, my colleagues talk about critical theory, and I always I thought it was critical thinking. I thought it was such a great thing. When they wanted to include it in every syllabus, I thought, well, I guess, the, I guess it's a good thing that we're rejecting all those other points of interest. We're rejecting those for other courses, but let's keep doing this critical theory thing. Uh, so I was naive, uh, but then... What happened was I, I noticed that I was falling out of favor with my colleagues. When Jordan Peterson came on the scene, I saw that he was, I didn't understand everything that he was about, and, but I did know that he was trying to say something in a university setting, and I, I supported that. And in fact, I was at Western when David Suzuki was uh, having his debate with Philippe uh, Rustin. And, and so I was aware of how beneficial it is when there are divergent views that are able to class. So I wrote, a, I wrote an op-ed in support of Jordan Peterson, and suddenly my colleagues didn't say hello to me in the halls. Uh, then about uh, six months after that, 
My own university canceled a speaker, uh, Danielle Robitaille, who was one of the defense team for Gomeshi. Uh, they, the students on campus, she was coming to speak on our campus, and students agitated until she canceled. And my administration did nothing. And, my, and many of my colleagues celebrated this. So I wrote another op-ed for the Toronto Star, and I said, what is going on at my university? And I made, uh, I made the comment that I said, where are the students getting this idea? And I said, it's from their, for, from their professors. And it was at that point that they held a special faculty meeting where they could tell me why I was wrong. But I come to free expression honestly, but I still didn't know Lindsay. But uh, you can see that we, we have similar interests. So moving ahead, let's talk about this next question. We didn't know each other prior to the incident. We have to fill in some of the gaps. It wasn't happy circumstances. So what led to this first article that appeared in the National Post, November 11th, that really showed what was going on in your situation? How did you get there and what, what happened to get you there? It was Christy Blatchford's article. Yes, okay, so um, as part of my grad program, I was a teaching assistant and because my degree was in communication, uh, I TA'd communication studies 101, Canadian communication and context. And so half of that course is um, content and discussion and the other half is writing skills. And for that course, there was two weeks where you had to do grammar. Um, and so I, I did, I covered grammar as dry as it was. And um, For university students, right? For university students right. who should maybe already know uh, I'm subject not making verb judgments, agreement. Lindsay. I'm not making judgments. I mean, the suggested example um, outline of what we needed to teach for grammar was um, I walk, you walk, she walks, right. we walk. Um, so I just made sure my students were all on the same page with conjugating verbs in the English language. Um, and then I thought, um, well, let's, instead of just looking at grammar as something dry, let's think of it as actually something that maybe has implications in society. Connect it to a bigger picture. Uh, and so I brought up the, the topical issue of gender neutral pronouns and how are those going to be integrated into the English language um, and how does that work? And so I used a clip from Television Ontario, TVO, public uh, access public, television. So millions yeah. of people have watched this already. It's now on YouTube, available to everyone. Yep. Right. Um, and it was on the agenda with Steve Pakin, one of Canada's best journalists. Um, and it was between Jordan Peterson, who, yes, I, I know, had never <laughs> met him. You really uh, that, had never <laughs> met him. Right, and that exactly. was the first clip I'd ever seen of him. Um, and he was in conversation with Nicholas Matt, who was a professor of transgender studies at U of T. And I just showed two short clips of them in exchange, um, talking specifically about, you know, they and them pronouns, um, Z and Zer. And um, so obviously uh, Matt's argument, Professor Matt, was saying, well, we need to use these. It's, it's about human dignity. And Peterson was saying, well, no, it's compelled speech. And so I had like, a 10 minute conversation uh, with my students in three different sections of 25 students. Uh, and I thought it went well. Right. No, one, no one stormed out of the room, no one cried. It was, it was <laughs> civil, <laughs> right? Um, but it turns out there, someone had a problem. And so I received an email the next week, um, just a very vague email saying, you need to, and this was from my supervising professor, Professor Rambukana. He said, you need to come into a meeting with me, your master's program director, Herbert Pimlot, and uh, an official from the Diversity and Equity Office. And at that point, I was not familiar with all this stuff about, ooh, diversity and equity, it's dangerous. I had no idea, but I still saw that, and I thought, this could only be about the Jordan Peterson clip. That's it. Um, and so I thought, this is pretty crazy. So I called my mom, and we had a discussion. And we decided that I should um, go to this meeting, which was in less than 24 hours, by the way. And, I, and they never suggested to me I could bring anybody. And for the record, TAs at Loria, you're not unionized, so there was no union rep or anything. And um, so I went to the meeting, and I did secretly record it. Right. Um, and then the meeting was pretty outrageous to me. I was accused of transphobia. Um, violating Bill C-16, which is something we talked about in the class. And Bill C-16 is, is the bill that says you must uh, 
um, not prejudice against people who are who gender identify a certain way and right and a lot of that bill is just completely valid like you don't discriminate hiring transgender people of course but then it was just the compelled speech part of it right and they'd also said that you had transgressed uh, the gendered sexual and violence policy which I did yes which because you'd made someone uncomfortable yes because um, I learned in that meeting that uh, gender neutral pronouns are not up for debate and it's just something you can't talk about um, and it creates a toxic environment to present both arguments for and against them. And th those were actual quotes yes, that toxic. were recorded. Yep. Uh, your Rambucana said that this is not up for debate. Right, and he also said it's like I neutrally played uh, a speech by Hitler. So right. equating Peterson Well, Hitler. equating TV mm -hmm. Ontario mm, yeah. to a speech by Hitler. Yeah. So, so this transpires, and at one point you were wondering who was the person who had brought the charge against you? Yes, um, and I did ask multiple times in the meeting. I said, how many people complained? Like, who? I don't need their name, but like, it kind of matters. Was it one person or was it like 10 people? Um, but they wouldn't give me a single, you know, they wouldn't even show me the complaint. Like, I could not see it in the original words or anything. Um, but it turns out that no one actually complained. Right, <laughs> right. So we're jumping ahead a little yeah. bit, but after an investigation, it was shown that no one had complained. Yeah. It was made up. It, it seems, and again, I still don't know. And the thing is, if I hadn't recorded this and hadn't gone to the media with it, would I have ever known? I would have probably gone on forever thinking, wow, I actually hurt somebody or multiple people. And that could have actually affected how I conduct my entire life. Probably. Right. Yeah. Okay, so let's take, you, you've got this recording now. Yeah. Uh, you've heard some crazy talk from two professors and a representative from the Diversity and Equity Office. Yeah. And now you've got this recording and you know that uh, potentially this is going to damage your career academically. Yes. They're, they're bringing this against you. Mm -hmm. uh, you decide to take action by going to the media. That's right? right, yeah. So, so who did you go to and what was, what, we know it's going to be Christy Blatchford, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so I did get some people criticizing me, like, why didn't you just go to the deans or something? Um, and it's like, well, you know, and this was touched on earlier, it would have just become in a different framework. Like, it would have just been kind of covered up and like, Yeah, you know. well, the very fact that we had, we still have a, a university president who was not willing to say from the outset that you'd done nothing wrong. Right. Right, she would not come to your defense. And, and no one from the university came to your defense. Uh, as far as I know, uh, am I am I well, right you, with that? You did. Oh, I did. Oh, you okay. did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so so someone did. Thank God for him. Uh, so so I'll, just to jump in, then I, I did see. I here. This is going to paint me. I, I'm sure my colleagues are going to watch this video. So I was coming back from a hunting trip with a gun. Uh, oh boy. Now now and I probably ate red meat while I was there. Oh. But, but anyway, <laughs> it was, anyway, uh, so I was coming back. It was the Saturday, the Sunday after the Blatchford piece had come out. And I, I said to my wife, okay, well, I've had fun, didn't get anything. Uh, can I read the newspapers? And she said, no. She said, you can't read the newspapers. This was November 12th. I said, well, why not? She said, you're not going to like what you read in the newspapers. <laughs> and so I saw Christy Blatchford's piece and I saw what had happened to Lindsay and I thought, they're at it again. I mean, I've seen this on campus time and time again, but here's finally, okay, and I didn't realize that it was recording. I saw all the quotes and I wondered how that had happened, I, but I didn't know. I immediately contacted Christy Blatchford. I didn't know her. I just, I couldn't find Lindsay's email. So I contacted Lindsay, or I'm sorry, uh, Christy, and I said, can you put me in touch with this uh, young lady? Uh, I know what she's going through. I know the climate on my university and I need to reach out to her. Uh, Christy was good enough to be the conduit for that. Also, at the same time, I sent an email to my president, the president of my university, uh, an email to Ram Buchana, an email to Pimlot, and I said, is this true? You know, is this true? Because maybe it wasn't. I said, please, let me know. And to my president, I said, you know, I, about a year ago, when I told you that this was going to happen, when I said that we have a real problem with free expression on our campus, that we've got a culture 
of professors who are trying to shut down free expression and telling students to do it. Remember when we had that private meeting and I said that it could happen, it would get worse? Well, now it has. I didn't get any response. I never have from my university president, incidentally. I didn't get any response from Ram Buchanan. I didn't get any response from Pim Lott. So I, I took that to be that what I was reading from Christy Blatchford was accurate. I then wrote my own article for the Toronto Star because I thought, well, we need to get this story out even more. Uh, and then after that, Lindsay did contact me and said, it's true what's happened. I have a recording. Uh, and we, we decided, where do we go from here? And it was at that point, uh, being previously in the media, I, I have some friends still who, who are in television, and uh, I was able to reach out to Global News, and I, I was able to organize with Lindsay an interview for that Friday of the same week, because I just thought, this is so important. Uh, and it really did take some convincing, because at that time, the media still didn't get, I mean, these people had gone to university, the people who are journalists, they'd gone to university even 10, 20 years ago. They don't know what has happened on our campuses since then. They don't appreciate it. But uh, one national reporter, Mike Rollet, was kind enough to come out, and that's actually where we met the first time, mm -hmm. right? And uh, it was at that point, Mike Rollet does the story for Global National News, and the tape, the recording, goes viral. Right? right. What were your thoughts about releasing that recording? Yeah, so at first when um, Christy Blatchford broke the story, um, I wasn't sure about the legalities of the recording, so I just said to her, can you just make it seem like I have a good memory and like these quotes <laughs> come? Um, and she was like, okay. And later I did learn that um, only one person in the room needs to know that there's a recording going on. That person is me, obviously. Um, you can't just leave a recording, a recorder in one room and leave, right? As long as I was there. Um, so then I realized, okay, it's, it's okay if this is released. Um, but yes, Global, the thing is, I don't actually remember giving them permission to release it. <laughs> well, I remember um, them saying, like, can we do an excerpt? Or can, they were, I think they I were agreed to an excerpt. An excerpt, yeah. not knowing what that would actually be no. at the time. But um, then that, yeah. the, the what did they say? What was out of the, the cow was out of the barn by yes. that point? Yeah. And the thing, I was worried about releasing it because, like, I do cry in it. It's <laughs> kind of embarrassing. <laughs> well, I, you might not want to mention this, but her mother says, I think people might think that you are mentally unstable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which, which was really, I mean, if you've heard this recording, you, you can see that here is a woman of incredible intestinal fortitude, honestly. And, and, and it is, I mean, I would have cried with those bullies <laughs> because that's what they were and you could hear it. And the fact that she could still keep the presence of mind even under this incredible stress was fantastic. So, so okay, the, it goes viral. Uh, then, then what happens? Like, let's go to the other chronology. Now the world is listening. And in terms of national media, there were, was a two-week period where almost every national newspaper and the post media chain were running articles about free expression and Lindsay Shepard's case. So what were you seeing happening there? We've got things going on, like uh, an invest investigation is launched, but, but what else? What were you seeing chronologically? Um, yes, so there was the investigation. Um, I mean, we can jump ahead and there was eventually an apology. Yeah. From Professor Ram Buchanan and from the president. Right, right. Um, but, you know, yes, it was almost like overnight. Suddenly I noticed like really prominent people were following me uh, on Twitter. Well, you, and this <laughs> was, you, you, you had never been on Twitter. Right, I created Then you're on Twitter, yeah. and then you have 50,000 Twitter followers. Uh, well, it built up, but yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> and, and at one point, uh, I jokingly said, well, now you have more Twitter followers than Laurier University. Oh, yeah, that was, that was funny. Or, right? Yeah. Uh, so this investigation, though, th what's interesting is all the weird things that happen before you get the apology. Because our president goes on TVO. Yes. So what happened On the that? agenda. On the agenda. In a very agenda. meta way. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if we can show that clip in our classes. It's Where still up in the air. I don't know. <laughs> I don't, but so, so what happened? What happened? Yeah, so um, she kind of kept repeating. She, you know, they were not coming out in defense of free expression, obviously. Right. It, she kept kind of repeating the line um, to Steve Pakin, you know, I can't speak to what happened in the classroom, you know. And it, it kind of was a moment for me where I realized, like, you know, it, university administrators, they 
can't take their own position, which was sad. And this they're not going to stand behind you. Right. Uh, you actually had to get legal counsel. Yes, Howard uh, Levitt. H Howard Levitt, mm -hmm. uh, pro bono, yes. uh, comes and says, I'll, I'll just be with you on this and take a look at what's going on. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, an investigator comes in and says, you've done nothing wrong. Right. And then they, is the apology after that? Is, uh, it is, yep. Yep, so I did nothing wrong. But there's still people who will contend today that what I did was very wrong. So it, for the people who already thought that, were they convinced by that? Probably not. Okay, let's talk about that. So yeah. you're, you are, you get the apology, but who on the campus, let's not talk about administration or even Pimlot and Rambo Buchanan, but who on the campus was hostile toward what you were doing with free expression? Um, it was the Rainbow Center. So the so LGBTQ the... activists. And what was their issue? Um, so they were saying that I was perpetuating transphobia. And actually, any media outlet that covered my story was also perpetuating transphobia. And that it was silencing the voices of trans people who were actually at the center of this whole discussion. For them, it was not about inquiry, um, you know, classrooms or free expression. It was about trans rights. Um, you know, and I just don't see that as the center of the story. Uh, it could have been anything I was discussing in my classroom. It didn't have to be gender pronouns. There are other taboo or, you know, topics that some people are much too afraid to touch, right? It, and what stands out to me is there were people uh, in the transgendered community who were supporting you. Yes. But there, and they, we, we had articles in the newspaper, local newspaper, from, from certain people mm -hmm. uh, and others who came to a rally for free expression. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that to me shows that really it was disingenuous for those groups at the Rainbow Center to say that they were the voice of the transgendered community. They weren't. They were the most vocal, the most hostile, but they certainly weren't the unified voice on right. that. Okay, so something I noticed, and if we can get to this in, in the uh, question and answer, I'd love to go through it. There was a really interesting communication strategy that was used by the forces of censorship on my campus. I don't want to get into it now because I want to keep pursuing what's going on with Lindsay's situation. But there was, there were, it was like an organized appeal campaign that just went through one and then, then when that one didn't work, they went to another. So if we have time in the question and answer, we can talk about how what I would call the far left and left leaning forces on my campus, or the authoritarians, if you'd rather, uh, how they twisted language in order to really get their way or tried to get their way. So we can talk about that, but maybe that'll be Q&A. Uh, but just being mindful of the time. You, you had hostility from outside of your program, but what, we've had some conversations about what it was like to be a master's student after this hit the wall. Mm -hmm. this, because you're, you didn't leave the university, and you're in a program that uh, these, these professors are really indicative of the culture in your program, and you're still in the program. So what was it like to be in the CAST program as a student after you get an apology, but you're still having to finish your, your master's work? Right, it was still like hostile. Um, I did not have friends in the room. Um, only two of them bothered to actually talk to me about what had happened. The rest just presumed, like I, I am a terrible person and just disassociated. I used to go for coffee after class with all them. It just stopped. Um, some, you know, some of my classmates would tweet things like, um, that bitch Lindsay Shepard needs to shut the fuck up. <laughs> things like that. Um, I don't know if my classmates were involved in this, but there was an interesting campaign. Um, all around town and around the university campus, there were these black stickers with white text that said, uh, fucking expel Lindsay Shepard already. It didn't have were, a spelling mistake on and it? It, had, it was expel, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I'm not making it up. Yeah. It was two L's on they expel. They didn't take your grammar tutorial. Right, yeah. yeah. Too bad. Yeah, and they sharpied out the extra L that they put. <laughs> um, so. That, uh, yeah. That, you know, that gives me hope. It means I don't have to worry so much about my foes in this particular battle. Okay, so you, you have had some really tense times in your program. Uh, let's finish off talking about maybe positive outcomes. So has something, has something positive come from this? Has there been 
a ray of sunshine in all of this rainy gloom? Um, I think maybe a lot of people woke up, like especially on the Laurier campus, because this is something that, you know, everyone was talking about, really. And it almost kind of forced them, you know, the students, to engage with the issue. I don't want to say take a side, but like, you know, hear what each, what everyone has to say. Um, and so when you're that close to what's happening in, you know, a national news story, international news in a lot of cases, um, you know, it, they kind of woke up to something that otherwise they might have not realized as a problem. Because if your opinions fall within the orthodoxy, you might never confront, you might never think there's a problem with freedom of expression because um, you never run counter to it. Right. You did, and you ended up uh, starting a club on campus. Yes, the Laurier Society for Open Inquiry, which is and that's the group gone that's off no problem. Francis Wittesen. Right, yeah. that's that's been just a cakewalk. Oh. oh yeah, it's no problem. It's not like we had to raise like on GoFundMe like almost six thousand dollars to bring in a university professor to our campus. Yeah, Francis yeah. Wittesen, who's here today. Yeah. Yeah, she's quite controversial. She's scary. Oh she's yeah, scary. terrifying. <laughs> you know why a student group has to pay to bring a professor to another campus is beyond me. And there's an intersection here with something else that's happened recently. If I had to answer the question, what, what was something positive that came out of the Lindsay Shepard scandal, I would have said, well, we did have a free expression task force that, that then looked at the issue of free expression on our campus. And I'm one of the members, or I was, up until a couple days ago. Uh, and it, it was uh, an interesting experience because I was the only one going into the task force who was unequivocal in my support for maximum free expression. And I don't know the position of all my colleagues. I know the majority were probably not, I don't want to read their minds, so they weren't, they weren't saying they were free expression supporters, and certainly other things they'd said outside of the committee suggested they weren't. But nonetheless, we did come up with a document that did support freedom of expression on our campus. I was actually quite proud of it, and I think that everyone on that task force had come to some compromises. And we, we had a document that we were happy with, and it was a draft document. It wasn't complete. It was still going to be opened up to the public so that they could give their input. It wasn't a done deal. It still isn't a done deal, but it was still moving in the right direction, direction I felt. But then what has just happened this week is the administration at my campus, outside of the task force, completely unknown to the task force, has now said that it's going to charge security fees for groups or professors or associations who want to bring a speaker onto our campus. Now that might sound innocuous enough, except that this really is a tax on those students or faculty or associations who are right-leaning or libertarian or conservative because the only people who protest at my campus and on the majority of campus are on the left and they protest people who are right-leaning. So this is actually a fee if you want to be someone who's libertarian, conservative or right-leaning. And so I, I looked at this and I said, we've just crafted a free expression statement that says we will support the university institutionally will support marginalized voices. Well, I can show you excellent research that shows the most marginalized voices on university campuses are those who are libertarian, conservative, or right-leaning. They are the most marginalized voices when it comes to free expression. How much money does my university spend to help those marginalized voices? Zero. They do spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to give a platform to left-leaning voices through our diversity and equity office. So they're already doing that, and I'm okay with that. But there is no equity. They're asking people of a right-leaning persuasion, libertarians, conservatives, you need to pony up. So what they've in fact done is they've created a tax on free expression. It's not free expression if you're coming from a conservative position. So I asked my colleagues on the task force, I said, will you stand with me just to say we will not work toward a final draft? We won't work toward a final draft until the university rescinds this policy, at least so that we could discuss it. But unfortunately, I couldn't get the support of my task force colleagues on this. So I had no choice. Because it's not a free expression document anymore, this task force document, because it doesn't do what it says it will do. Because 
it doesn't allow marginalized voices to have a say. So I, I, at this point, I've stepped down. And I'm hoping that my university will say, yeah, we will rescind that policy. And we can talk more about that at uh, the question and answer, if you'd like. But just to get to the end of this then, what's your advice, Lindsay? What's your advice to students who may be entering university, or they're already there, and they see that they're being indoctrinated, not educated? What, what would you say to them? Um, I see self-censorship as one of the biggest problems, and it's something I did throughout my entire undergrad. And I would even walk away from class and really wish I said something or challenged something, but I, I barely ever did. Um, and so that's something we really need to stop. So because don't self-censor? Don't, yeah. Um, we need to be able to say things, even, you know, because I was worried about looking dumb. I was worried about, like, people thinking I'm a bad person. Um, but that's you know, not an environment you can really learn in. That's not an environment you can have open conversations. Um, because there, there are kind of, and these are the grad students in my program, they, they want to police your thought, right? I mean, I started speaking out this semester. I thought I have nothing to lose. <laughs> they already don't like me. And oh yes, they, um, there are some students who just wouldn't come to class anymore because I was there and stuff like that, so <laughs> yeah. 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 So if you are a student here today, uh, take heart. As human beings, we follow, I, I think it's easier for us to look at someone who's doing it already. I know that I'm that way. We, we're hearing from Gad Sad today. And back when I first started being aware of free expression, I wondered, is anybody else concerned about this? And I was really grateful to see that Gad was very vocal a, a, on his YouTube channel. And I sent him an email. I said, I'm grateful for what you're doing. I'm grateful there's a model to follow. I'm looking forward to hearing from him today. Uh, if you are a professor here today, or in some way you're still on a university campus, we need to learn to be more disagreeable. We can do it civilly. <laughs> That's a, a nod to Mark. But we need to be disagreeable. We need to find opportunities to be disagreeable. We need to create those opportunities. We need to find YouTube videos, we don't need to always bring in speakers. If you don't have a budget to bring in speakers, find a YouTube video that you know has academic merit, but also is going to drive the left crazy or drive the authoritarians crazy. Because I, 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 I'm sorry, these dichotomies of left, right, it, it's not always useful. I realize that. Uh, and I, I nodded to Francis on this because Francis is, uh, you know, uh, she's a lefty in the best way. <laughs> But, but it is, there's an authoritarian culture on campus that, that is against free expression. So I would encourage you, look for those opportunities where you can have a showing of some kind of video. Make a little bit of a stink. Stir the pot. Because it's only by pushing back that we're finally going to get somewhere into the middle again. All right, well, thank you for your time, everybody. I'd say disputatious rather than disagreeable. <laughs> okay, I don't want to be disagreeable. Uh, questions for uh, Lindsay and, uh, oh. well, James, sure. Dr. Legan, Dr. James DeLatter, um, this is Dr. Legan. We're both war vets. And uh, when I was in Vietnam, we had um, you know, this policy that, you know, if you're attacked and surrounded and that sort of thing, that you bring down. You bring down airstrikes on your own position, and that's what I felt at some schools. Not Hillsdale, I taught there three years, but other schools, you know. Um, it was like that. It was in your face. And when I think of trans, what comes to mind, trans this and trans that, is transmogrification um, of... of a grammatical term, that is gender. I, I don't want to split, but I'm sure we have a split in this. Some uh, think that, and I've already talked to them, that gender is a grammatical term. Those of us who are trained up in Greek and Latin, you know, we learn the, we, we learn the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the inflections. Um, the other is sex, of course, and I'd be interested in, I realize that uh, conservatives, libertarians, 
let's make room for reactionaries. Like, yay unto the Middle Ages. Um, I think Clive. I, oh, Robert, and then Clive. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm from the University of Regina in uh, Saskatchewan. One of the things that I, um, d one of the things that I've realized um, being in a university environment is if you are uh, unorthodox or heterodox in your opinions, you really have to be um, well thought out and really understand your case really strongly. While if you have an orthodox opinion, you can speak patent nonsense most of the time. <laughs> And people never uh, question or critique you in that. And I don't know if you've found somewhat similar in at the University of Laurier or. What about in your program? I guess. Right. I mean, isn't don't they say duck speak? Like, mm. you just kind of repeat the usual points just to you know appeal to the people who already are on your side, I suppose. So yes, and that's why a lot of the times when you, so for example. Um, uh, someone wrote to me on social media, and they said that every time I bring in uh, a speaker, like Frances Widowson, <laughs> um, it takes people like her uh, weeks and months to heal. Um, and I'm damaging entire communities. And she wrote this in a public forum, so I also replied in the public forum, and I said, what do you mean? Like, what are you talking about? Um, because my first instinct was I felt bad for her. But then I read it again, and I was like, I just don't get how. You're not forced to attend these talks. Um, you're not forced to actually engage with the ideas at all, probably. Um, how does it take you months to heal? Um, but yeah, they, they can't really respond. And they don't have to, actually, because um, they'll have people on their side anyway, right? Yeah. Well, the okay. ticket in your hand. Make me, make me work. Huh? Uh, first, I just want to uh, see if you can confirm, in the class where you showed the clip from Peterson, did you take a side? No. The neutrality was the problem. Oh. Yes. Okay. If I had denounced his views first, it would have been okay. If I said, oh, here are some terrible views by Jordan Peterson, this is what not to have. It would have been great. <laughs> okay, so there, there, you didn't affirmatively demean anybody at all in that selection. So how does it come from the way you behaved, which sounds perfectly appropriate in the university setting, uh, not to tell the students what to think about material that you're <coughs> showing them, to being called a white supremacist? I mean, where, where does that come from? Right. No, that was... Um that was really interesting for me. Because that all of a sudden, yes, there were posts calling me a white supremacist. And uh, I'm perpetuating white privilege. Um, I'm using my whiteness. I'm using my white tears. I'm a crying white girl. Um, people, before they even knew anything about me, were like, I'm a white ethnostate sympathizer, things like that. Um, and I, I still don't really get it. Um, do you know why? Well, it, it's better than making an argument. Wait, you weren't wearing a, a white hood. Um, no, there was no hood. She had no hood. At the time, right? No. Thank you. Um, I'd like to go back for a second. Um, sorry. Um, I'm from the University of Toronto, Mississauga, but I'd like to go back for a second to something that Lindsay said, and I would also like to go back to uh, the idea that you brought up during the discussion of how. Uh, the authoritarians and, and campus elites twist uh, their campaigns and how they're trying to get to something. Well, this something, I think, is part of something that Thomas Sowell noticed a long time ago when he wrote about elites. Uh, elites these days don't dispute us on ideas. This is not about proving a point or making um, uh, making a reasoned statement. A lot of where they go to, and this is something that so well noticed, is to make us feel morally wrong. And Lindsay mentioned at some point that one of the reasons why she didn't speak in class, and that is also myself, I often don't speak up. Why don't I speak up? Because I know that um, whether or not I will be judged to be stupid or incoherent, I will be judged to be evil. I will be judged to be morally on the wrong side. Um, often uh, spoken as the wrong side of history. So I'd like you, if you can, 
to speak about that, and I would like um, David to go back to this idea of um, how is it that authoritarians are twisting that speech, and how is it that they're really confirming what Sowell has written about them um, already a long time ago? Yeah, um, they, the classes I've been in, they, they kind of establish themselves as like the moral police, right? Um, and it even makes me question myself. Like one of the first examples that comes to mind was a race and media course I took in my undergrad. And the prof, who was actually not a prof, he was just like a sessional, but he said, he asked the class um, in a rhetorical way, he was like a social justice warrior, right? He's like, um, why isn't Ramadan a national holiday in Canada? Um, Christmas is, so why don't we have Ramadan? And like, my first instinct was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but like, you can't say that. And so it, it makes you actually think, wow, like, why did I have that reaction? Like, am I a bad person? Ramadan should be a, a national holiday, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so if I'm just going to. Uh, one thing, you, you made me think of something I hadn't thought of before. So I do research in sociology of religion, and you made me think about, and I don't know where this will go yet, but thank you. So in established religious traditions, you are made to feel guilty about sin, but you also have a way to propitiate that sin. If Christianity, you ask forgiveness. If Judaism, there are means. These religious systems say, here, feel guilty but then here's how to propitiate that guilt. But with social justice philosophy, and I'm using that in, in scare quotes, they definitely know how to make you feel guilty. <laughs> but they really, the way to propitiate guilt is to make other people feel guilty, which is really interesting because I see it as a religious movement, right? It, and so, so that's very interesting to me. I'm gonna think more about that. Uh, now back to the question about how did they twist the words. I saw three movements, which was really incredible. The first movement was that when they were saying why we should stop talking about free expression on campus, the first movement was because it causes harm. Right? That, that was their go-to. This is causing harm. So, you know, I look at this and I say, okay, well, what is the definition of harm? Because you realize they are trying to redefine terms. So the definition of harm is... Uh, and this is sort of a legal definition, it's an infliction of long-term damage that compromises normal appearance or function. So you get this idea, long-term damage, compromising something. So is that happening? Because what they're saying is harm was a fence. So they're trying to say that I'm mentally harmed by it. I'm saying, well, well, no, no. Because, and then I started looking at, at the psychological data on this. And there's a really good study by Scott Lillefeld, uh, and it was the origins of microaggressions is what he, but he looked at all of the literature. It was a meta-analysis, and he says, there's, you just cannot substantiate the claim that ideas, offensive ideas, harm you. It's just not there. In fact, if you look at cognitive behavioral therapy, they'll tell you that the best way to overcome this idea of feeling harmed by ideas is be exposed to those offensive ideas. So what they were saying about ideas harming was completely wrong. So then when, when other people, other academics, newspapers started saying that, they moved to the next strategy. And the next strategy was, well, all this discussion of Lindsay Shepard and free expression is causing physical violence. And so they were saying, there have been threats on lives. And I'll just cut to the chase. So Globe and Mail, Global TV said, okay, we're going to go check with campus police and we're going to check with the Waterloo Regional Police to see if anyone has lodged these threats against their lives. There wasn't a single complaint. So unless they were just braving them themselves, I'm being threatened my physical, with this physical violence, death threats is one of the things they said. They were, but they weren't going to the police with them. So when that was exposed, they moved to the next, and I think this was the most clever slash diabolical they said, you know what, we just need to contextualize. Yes, we can have debate on campus, but we have to contextualize. Well, what does it mean to contextualize? It means that we must filter it through a critical theory lens. So we'll let you have both sides, 
but we'll make clear which of these sides is bullshit. And, and this is what we'll do for you students. We'll filter it for you. So we'll definitely have two sides. And there were op-eds from colleagues of mine who were essentially saying, we'll just filter it through the critical lens. So this idea of contextualization was their third move. And of course, one of the moves that fits into all of these is this idea of, well, hate speech isn't free speech. And you continue to hear that. And again, it's a redefinition of what hate speech is. And so hate speech under Section 319, and we've got lawyers here who can articulate this better than I, but really, it is a high, high bar. And offending someone, when, it, when you either have truth, or it's fair comment, or it's done civilly, I mean, that's not hate speech. It's just not, but they were trying to equate the two. And of course, if they can redefine hate speech, which they continue, they are always trying to do that, then, then they will be able to censor on our campuses and, and really in society more generally. So those are the moves I saw. Thanks for the question. But with your second point um, about police complaints, I mean, the police are a tool of oppression to them. So, I mean, that's why they wouldn't go to the, you know, just arguing their side. No, I appreciate and, that. And they, do, they don't have that. to, this is a quote from one of the activists, they don't have to perform their trauma for us. You know, they don't, they don't have to, it can just be um, within, they don't have to tell anybody, but it still exists because okay. they don't have to perform their trauma. Right. Okay. Bill. Okay. Just a, an observation or two. Uh, thank you for your remarks and for your experiences and your sticking your necks out uh, as we, we all should do. I think, you know, what, what percolates to the top in my mind is that uh, we're, we're in a very difficult struggle because the meta narrative, to borrow someone else's phrase, um, the benchmark for judgment of justice uh, is safety and comfort on our campus. Uh, and trying to appeal uh, to a construct of disputatious free expression and sculpting some sense of a better collective truth after discussion and argumentation almost doesn't exist. Uh, the automatic, the heuristic, the, uh, uh, the uh, instantaneous benchmark is comfort. So that's, that's one thought that I scribbled on. The other thought is something that's missing from this discussion. Uh, I spent 40 years as a researcher in human sexuality and prejudice, um, uh, and almost as long you know, uh, uh, in, in civil liberties pursuits. But what is missing a little bit from the discussion is sympathy. If, if an indigenous person says, you know, I've had a struggle, I've had a historical struggle, you know, you have a perfect right to, you know, to raise these issues, but it does affect me. You know, just that, that's fine. So listen, if a, if a trans person says, I've had a struggle, and you're surfacing this issue, you know, brings it home to me. Uh, that doesn't mean, you know, that you can't talk about it. So, for example, when my multitude of colleagues uh, tell me that uh, Jordan Peterson is transphobic, I say, no, Jordan P Peterson is concerned about compelled speech. Uh, and... Uh, you know, uh, at the same time, I express sympathy for people who are struggling with, you know, with, with, with their struggle. Uh, so I, I don't want to forget the sympathy piece. Uh, but what we're confronting fundamentally uh, is a benchmark for acceptable speech that involves comfort. And any construct, uh, any mental reach, uh, any purchase on the idea of the desirability of free expression disputation and the quaint medieval idea of a university where people work together to figure out, you know, is this an elephant or is this a donkey, we're all blind. Um, that, that almost doesn't exist. Uh, by the way, the, you know, I would divorce the um, uh, distinction of attacks on, on the right wing. It's really, um, uh, uh, it's really an instrument of censoriousness against any controversy. Um, it's easier than burning books and less conspicuous. Uh, but if it costs me $6,000 to take this book out of the library or to listen or to talk, that's, that's a pox on any controversial idea. Uh, just to respond to this, I would commend people to take a look at a recent study published on Heterodex Academy where they did look at uh, who does the disrupting. And so 90.5% uh, of disruptions, 90.5% of disruptions on university campuses in the United States happen from left-leaning protesters protesting right-leaning speakers. Uh, my question is about the complaint that was not, not a complaint. Um, and the question is this. I read somewhere online, and I can't remember, I can't remember where it was, that the, uh, even the unofficial complaint, because there must have been some filtered 
message that reached the powers that be did not come from students in, in, in your seminar, but from somebody who had overheard two students speaking about the seminar in a cafeteria. Is, is that just a canard, or perhaps you don't know? Is, is, that, is, that, is that because the students that were talking about your seminar may have been praising the seminar yes. and then overheard? I mean, it's a pure speculation on my part. I, I just wonder what, what you can tell us about that. Yeah, no, I've, I've certainly thought that. That's how I've been kind of explaining it to people is, so all we know from a McLean's article is that the Rainbow Center did facilitate a complaint. So it did not come from a student in my class. It came from the Rainbow Center. They were not asked to do it. They took it upon themselves. So yes, how they got that information, it could be this situation. Two students were talking favorably, and uh, these Rainbow Center people took it upon themselves to um, you know, tell the professor of my class. Or maybe one student um, was just talking in the Rainbow Center, maybe one of them uses the resources there, and was saying like, yeah, this like, kind of sucked. Maybe, like maybe they did have a problem but didn't want to make a complaint out of it. Uh, and I think I'll never know, actually. Yeah. But, but it's entirely possible that, because um, you, you said earlier you, you were afraid of carrying with you to your grave the guilt of having hurt somebody, it's entirely possible that you did you personally did not hurt anybody. This right, is yeah. trial by hearsay and, uh, yeah. and, and eavesdropping. Yeah. Right. And they don't feel like they owe me anything to tell me. So. Okay, so my question is for you, Lindsay, and it's in regard to uh, what you see moving forward. So, you know, as having done your master's at Laurier and progressing for that and being a TA, you know, I could take the assumption that you would ultimately down the line uh, would have wanted to go to become a professor. But now with this whole ordeal, I want to know if you see yourself staying within academia for a future profession, if that's something that still interests you. And if not, do you have any insight where you would want to go with um, like a communication background? Um, it's pretty up in the air for me. But um, I've had this discussion with Stephen Parrott. Um, so I think I could probably find a professor to supervise a PhD, sure. Maybe that's not the problem. But would I ever get hired? Um, <laughs> I don't think so. So maybe best not to try, who knows. We'll see if things change. Anyway. Um, I want to come back to the three professors, the three people, uh, Rambukana, Pimlet, and the, the ones who interviewed you. And my, my, my question is this. It would seem to me almost certainly that you weren't the first person to whom this kind of thing had happened. Have other people come forward and spoken to you and said, look, don't tell anybody, but this kind of thing happened to me. What can you tell us about this manner of, of, uh, of affecting their ideological control? Yes, I get tons of messages from people with similar things. I think what was so, I think mine is still maybe the most extreme though, just because I was neutral. A lot of the messages I get is from people who say they took a conservative standpoint, they took a right-leaning standpoint, which they should still absolutely be allowed to do. Um, but the thing with me is I didn't take any stand. <laughs> um, so that's what makes it probably still the most extreme case. But yes, I get messages, you know, at least once a week. And also from professors, too, not just students. Professors who are, but, you know. But that means that there's a seething lot behind the scenes who are very, very, very unhappy about the way things are going on. Yes. And these people should come forward and. They feel they can. But, but if you come forward, your mark is in jeopardy. Your degree is in jeopardy. Yeah. Uh, and, and, this, and I have, I, I've received many emails from students. I've had students in my office. I had, I had one fellow who came to my office. He was a mature student. He'd come back to university. He had a wife. He had a daughter. He was, he was paying for uh, his own education. And he was finishing his fourth year of university. And he came to my office in tears. And he said, for four years, I've been told that I'm the scourge of the earth because I'm a white male. He said, he said I've been doing a degree. I won't say that but but he had just and he could not say anything in his own defense because he had come from a single mother uh, he'd worked his way up he'd gotten married uh, he'd he'd thought that he had he'd performed nobly 
throughout his life. But he was told so many things about why he was a terrible person. And sadly, this is routine on our campuses now. And identity politics does this because it, it takes away the idea of the individual. And it makes us tribal. And if you're part of the wrong tribe, well then, unfortunately, you're going to have to suffer the consequences. We'll give Francis the last question and then it's time for, uh, for lunch. Uh, quick. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, Lindsay, um, you, things have changed. Your, what happened to you has changed what has happened on campuses. And I just gave a speech about Lindsay's case on Monday to about 40 professors who were in complete agreement with the terrible situation that uh, existed. But at the same time, we have to be very careful here that we can move things forward as a freedom of expression coalition, university-wide, Canada-wide, and there's a real danger if you see it as a right-wing, left-wing dichotomy. Um, I have talked to people from Wilfrid Laurier who said they wanted to speak up in favor of Lindsay, but they didn't because they feared being labeled a right-winger. That's the problem. So if you're going to say, um, we want to crush the left and the social justice warriors and all this kind of terminology, you're not going to get the, that middle, that large middle that really wants to support freedom of expression, but they're afraid to do so because they're going to be seen as someone who's on the right. I'm a socialist. I'm not a right winger. Christy Blatchford's piece in the National Post made it sound as if I were a right wing speaker. This is a huge problem. So if you're going to start talking, and, and the second thing is, these people are not on the left. The people who are claiming to be on the left, who are authoritarians, to politically correct totalitarians, they are not left wingers. They are using this idea of the left to get other people to sympathize with them and to go with them, but they are actually reactionaries. They, they want privilege. They are privilege-seeking groups that d care nothing about equality. They are trying to increase their own power in the university. And that really has to be made clear, because if we keep on saying, oh, these leftists and these far leftists, you're never going to get anyone who sees themselves as being a left-wing person to be a supporter of freedom of expression. Just to comment with that. The, well, I, I think that what you're saying has a lot of merit, Francis. I think that also the reality on the ground is anybody who does speak up for free expression, regardless of their political stand, they're going to be called right wing now, right? I, I mean, I mean, it, it's a problem, but it, it, it is not a, it's not the people who are on the right who are doing it. Well, the, I think the left, the people who call themselves leftists are actually farther to the right than the classical liber liberals and the libertarians. Uh, you may be right. I, I'm just saying that if, if, if it's a matter of labels, if it's a matter of labels, it's not the people. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, David. We'll go to lunch. Yeah.